interesting topic that's going to keep you all awake before we set you free. So my name is Shannon Bugis. I'm a senior policy analyst at the Arms Control Association. The topic of this panel is the uh, risk and regulation of artificial intelligence and nuclear command and control. So as I'm sure you've all been aware, the topic of AI has been dominating the airwaves, both in terms of the broader public sense and in terms of AI at the intersection of the AI and national security realms. So just to give a bit of the flavor for what you've probably been seeing in the news when it comes to AI, I covered, I looked for just the events in May alone. So it's been a number of things, and this is a non-exhaustive list uh, for anyone who tells me I forgot something. I didn't try to get everything. But first of all, dozens of academics, experts, and industry leaders, plus a few celebrities, signed a very straightforward, simple, one-sentence statement published by the Center for AI Safety that states that mitigating the risk of extinction from AI should be a global priority alongside other risks, such as nuclear war. Also in May, the Biden administration announced a $140 million investment to set up seven new AI research institutions. And this announcement followed, I lied a little bit, I'm covering events that happened before May. But this, event, this announcement followed the administration's release of an AI Bill of Rights, the AI Risk Management Framework, and the updated Defense Department Autonomy and Weapon Systems Directive. So now we're veering more into the AI defense and national security space. And so we've seen this month Representative Seth Moulton write a piece for the Boston Globe talking about the need for treaties and regulatory frameworks for AI. And Representative Ted Liu introduced legislation to ensure that there is always a human in the loop for all actions related to informing and executing decisions by the president to employ nuclear weapons. I'm going to end on a quote that I think came from a very good article earlier in May in The Atlantic by Ross Anderson. He succinctly, I think, described the tensions where AI and the military meet. So, quote, the world's major military powers have begun a race to wire AI into warfare. For the moment, that mostly means giving algorithms control over individual weapons or drone swarms. No one is inviting AI to formulate grand strategy or join a meeting of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. But the same seductive logic that accelerated the nuclear arms race could, over a period of years, propel AI up the chain of command." End quote. Concerns such as these are not particularly new. And in a panel on AI, I would be amiss not to mention the oft-quoted statement from Lieutenant, Lieutenant General Jack Shanahan in 2019. Then he was the director of the Pentagon's Artificial Intelligence Center, and he directly said that there is one area where he pauses when it, when it comes to AI integration, and that's nuclear command and control. So, as the panel's title suggests, the major thing we will dive into today, I tried to wrap this up into two simple questions, which was very hard, but what kind of risks might be present if AI finds its way into the chain of nuclear command and control? particularly at the highest levels that hold decision-making authority. What might regulation of AI in nuclear command and control, or we'll start probably saying NC2, what would that look like? So two brief notes that I want to just get to before I pose some questions to our panelists and we start rolling. So first of all, I asked our panelists to keep in mind that this is going to be more of a conversational discussion as well as an introductory panel regarding AI. So I will be falling on the sword for all of us who are not super familiar with AI and asking, please talk to me like I'm five years old. Um, try and keep it simple. We're, as much as we all want to dive into the weeds on these things, we unfortunately don't have the time. And then second, while this panel is looking at the risks, there are also benefits to what AI can do. And so the intention here is not to be fear-mongering or alarmist, but try and scoping our conversations to talk specifically about the risks and to be clear-eyed about what may happen when AI and NC2 meet. So speaking first today will be Helen Toner, who is the Director of Strategy and Foundational Research Grants at Georgetown Center for Security and Emerging Technology. Helen is also a member of the Board of Directors for OpenAI. Next up will be Chris Messerill, who is the director of Brookings Artificial Intelligence and Emerging Technology Initiative, 
as well as a fellow in foreign policy at Brookings. And then we will welcome Paul Dean, who is the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of State in the Bureau of Arms Control, Verification, and Compliance. At the same time, he serves as the U.S. Commissioner to New START's U.S.-Russia Bilateral Consultative Commission. So in a similar format to our previous panels today, we'll have around two rounds of questions for the panelists. For each round, the panelists will have about five minutes to respond to the questions I've posed. So round one is essentially the opening remarks, setting the groundwork for probably the more intense part, the more intense round two. After the two rounds, we're gonna to turn to questions from the audience. So same system, write the question on the piece of paper. We'll have ACA staff come around to gather those. All right, so that's it for logistics. Actually, I lied, one more thing. I had told our panelists beforehand that I really do want this conversation to, this discussion to be conversational. So we, you are more than welcome to jump in when you have comments on what the others are saying. Maybe just give me a signal so I don't just storm ahead. But if you have anything to say, please do. Um, and then we will be getting to your questions and making it open to the entire room. All right, so starting off with Helen. The term artificial intelligence gets thrown around a lot, but it can refer to a wide range of applications and capabilities. Can you set the stage for us by outlining what AI specifically means in the military context? What do the AI capabilities and the AI applications that are being talked about and being warned about in the press often these days, what do they really look like and do? And given your vast experience with China's AI ecosystem, please feel free, and I think it would be useful to have more of those concrete examples of when describing what AI actually looks like and means. For sure, great. Thank you so much for having me. It's mm -hmm. wonderful to be here um, on this incredibly important topic. And so, yeah, I'm gonna take that as an invitation to zoom way out and start yes. with, um, when we say AI, what do we mean? Um, what is artificial intelligence? And the definition I like to give here is computers doing smart stuff. And the reason I like that definition is because it's very vague and the term AI is very vague. Um, so that's one important thing to know. When it comes to the use of artificial intelligence in a military context, especially, it's, it's really important to recognize that AI can refer to many different generations of technology, many different generations of computers doing smart stuff. So some things that we might call AI, um, these kind of rule-based automation procedures, have been in use in military settings and other safety critical settings for decades. So if we're talking in aviation, you know, the autopilot algorithms that we're using, those are rule-based, they're very, it's very clear how they work, we have decades of experience with them, we know, we, we know how to use them safely. Similar for something like, um, you know, the Aegis sh uh, ship defense system, um, which is uh, defending against kind of incoming, incoming missile fire. That's, you could call it AI, it certainly, you know, has automated capability. Um, but both of those examples are, are very different from what has us all talking about AI so much over the past, you know, certainly six months, but even five years, ten years, which is a different category of AI called machine learning. And so machine learning is about taking problems where we can't figure out how to write down a set of rules, but instead we can give the computer lots of examples of what we're looking for, and it can find essentially statistical patterns. People say it learns statistical patterns in the data that it's given. And so this is very helpful for something like image processing. It turns out, you know, AI scientists tried for, for many years, but it turns out it's very difficult to write down rules for, okay, this is how you identify that this image, this set of pixels, contains a cat, or that this you know, set of pixels from a satellite contains, say, an enemy ship. Um, that's very hard. But it turns out that this machine learning approach where you're finding statistical patterns in large data sets, um, that is able to do that. So um, it's important to note, though, because it is a, you know, a statistical process identifying patterns as opposed to following set rules, that means two important things. One is that um, it's much harder to understand how the systems work. So with an autopilot system, if something goes wrong with the plane, we can go back, and I'm, I'm sort of simplifying, but essentially, you can see there, you know, there's these sets of rules of if this thing happens, if your sensor tells you this, then do that. If this other thing happens, then do another thing. Um, but with machine learning systems, that's really not how they work at all. You can sort of look inside them. It, there's nothing mystical about it. But when you look inside a machine learning system, what you get is millions, or at this point, even billions of numbers, which are getting multiplied together um, in order to convert your, your question into your answer. And so what that means is it's very, very challenging to understand exactly how they're processing the data that they're processing and to be confident kind of what they're gonna do well and poorly. And that has a, you know, an important 
corollary, which is that um, these systems often uh, tend to be brittle or tend to break in kind of unexpected ways. So the, the classic examples of this come from image processing, where it tans, turns out you can, you can take a system that seems to be good at looking at an image and classifying, you know, does this contain, uh, you know, or what, what is in this image? Is it a school bus? Is it a um, tomato? Is it a, again, you know, a tank? Um, and you can take a system that seems to be performing very well at that task. When you test it, you give it some examples. Um, maybe it gets, you know, 99% accuracy. But if you then go in and you um, tweak one of the images a little bit, you can throw the system off completely in a way that is very different from how humans work. So you can tweak some pixels, the picture looks exactly the same to the human, but the AI will tell you that a school bus is instead a tomato. Or you can go in and in the physical world, you can you know, take a stop sign and put some little stickers on the stop sign, little ones, so a human can still very clearly see this is a stop sign, but the AI suddenly says, oh, that's a speed limit sign, I should accelerate. So you know, these problems are absolutely universal throughout the machine learning systems we have so far. Um, and they, they are really important to have in mind sort of through, through this whole discussion. Um, and then another you know, important thing to know is that uh, AI is not one thing. It's not kind of a Terminator robot running around on the battlefield. Um, instead, it's essentially, I think, kind of the next generation of software. So it's, it's a way of designing software to do things that we haven't really been able to get software to do before. So if we're talking about, to get to your actual question of how AI is starting to be integrated into military systems, it's all kinds of ways. Pretty much anywhere where you could imagine using software to perform a, a function, you might start getting, or militaries are beginning to try to implement AI there. So some of the obvious examples would be autonomous vehicles or autonomous platforms, so ground vehicles, aerial vehicles, drones, um, undersea vehicles. But you're also seeing it for sure in, um, in logistics. So predictive maintenance is an, an application that the US government has experimented with a lot. Can you look at data on how this helicopter is being used, um, you know, how its engine is functioning, how long it's been in use, and can you predict, oh, okay, there's a higher chance that this particular helicopter might break down soon, we should go and you know, do maintenance on that in order to you know, increase the uptime, essentially, of your fleet. It's also being used AI for um, ISR applications, so satellite imagery for sure is a huge, um, huge uh, uh, potential source of use because you know, we have basically far more data than we can allow our human analysts to look at. Um, so not just satellite imagery, obviously all kinds of ISR imagery and, and, and incoming data. And so if you can have computers recognize patterns um, and ideally then you know, flag those things for a human to come and review, you can process much, much larger amounts of information. And it's also useful, AI is also useful for lots of um, back office functions as well. So, you know, lots of corporations around the country are, and the world are starting to use AI for things like HR management or finances or, uh, you know, at this point, drafting emails, you know, what, what have you. So there's also plenty of, obviously, you know, in the U.S. case, the DOD is, is a ginormous bureaucracy, as I think we all know. And so there's lots of these kind of day-to-day -day back office functions where AI can be really useful as well. So um, I guess on that note, I guess it's one thing I really want to emphasize um, in the context of this panel is that when we hear AI, we shouldn't always think of something that is fully autonomous and it is entirely operating on its own. Even if you think of kind of AI uh, that's built onto a drone, for instance, you certainly could build a drone that autonomously performs a mission. It autonomously flies out to a certain location, seeks out a target. I'm talking technically you could, not that it would be a good idea seeks out a target, identifies the target, engages the target, flies home. You could have a fully autonomous system, but you could just as easily uh, have a system that goes out, uh, maybe it finds the location by itself, maybe it identifies a potential target, but then it phones home and says, is this, this, here's a target, should I engage? You could also have a system um, that is you know, mostly being piloted by a human, and the human is almost always telling it what to do, uh, but if it happens to lose connection, maybe there's some unexpected weather patterns, maybe it's being jammed by an adversary, the AI might have autonomous functionality that lets it come home, just you know, return back to base. So there's, you know, those are just some examples. You could be using AI to, to stabilize you know, the drone in the air, things like that. So um, there's a really wide spectrum of, uh, even within a single application, like an AI-enabled drone, a really wide spectrum of what that can look like. And then, uh, there's also a really wide range of potential applications for what you would be using the AI to do. So I'll leave it there for now, but that's a beginning. Yeah, great. That's a great, hopefully, giving everyone a strong foundation for what we'll actually be talking about. And to pull on one theme, I think, from your remarks is the importance of the training data, right? So it's thinking about the humans have to think of I say the humans as if we aren't them, but humans have to think of every possibility, right? And that's what's informing the tra training data for the AI system. And if we don't think of an option, then that's where things go haywire. Um, and so I think that's one way that I tend to kind of highlight how 
we have to think of everything, right? And, and that's especially tricky in a, in a um, military context where we have an adversary who's actively trying to think of things we didn't think of. Yes. Even if that's the not the case, it's already hard to think of everything. But when they're actively trying to mess with you, that makes it even harder. Exactly. That makes a lot of sense. Was there any follow-up? I saw a lot of head nodding, so I wasn't sure. Chris? Well, uh, I, the only thing I would add is just, I, I hope everyone in the audience appreciates what a master class they just got in AI in five minutes. <laughs> yeah. That was extraordinary. Uh, and you know, it's, hopefully it'll make uh, the rest of the conversation a lot easier. That was phenomenal. <laughs> Yeah, we're all in awe of you right now, <laughs> Helen. Um, all right, so Chris, now you're fully on the hot seat. So we have the great context from Helen. And so we're coming to you because what you're specifically looking at in your work is a lot of risk mitigation and arms control strategies. Mm -hmm. So let's first start, though, with talking about what are those risks that these types of systems present to the battle space. In addition, will the military employment of AI destabilize the nuclear realm, particularly res with respect to NC2, or is there actually a stabilizing effect? Both, how concerned should we, should we be, should we not be? What is our main focus here? Um, I guess I would start by saying, uh, try and answer your last question first, which is to say we should be very concerned. I don't think we should be hysterical. I don't think the sky is falling, but we should be very concerned. Like I was asked to sign the letter uh, earlier, the reason I just did not sign the letter was not because I disagreed with it. It, was, it had to do with kind of political and signaling mechanisms. I actually am worried that we're sending the wrong message to China about the capabilities we currently have. Um, but uh, the, all of that is to say I take the risks of AI and the, the intersection in particular of AI and nuclear uh, extremely seriously. It is, uh, you know, of the ways in which AI could lead to kind of global catastrophe, that is by far, I think, the, uh, the leading and easiest way that that might actually happen. Um, and it really behooves all of us, both working on AI. I come primarily out of the AI space, working on AI and international security issues, and have come into the nuclear uh, space virtue that, uh, by virtue of that, that route. Um, but it, I think both on the AI side and those working on arms control and who have like the expertise on uh, nuclear nonproliferation, et cetera, Hopefully this is the start of many conversations in the years to come because it's an extremely uh, important uh, risk that we're going to have to challenge, uh, or that we're going to have to manage. Um, the risks in particular, though, that I, I want to be very specific about the kinds of risks that I am worried about. Uh, there's one set of risks that I've, you know, there, there have been a number of articles written about this that I'm, I'm not as worried about as some others, which would be the impact of AI on what we typically think of as strategic deterrence and like first strike and second strike capabilities, et cetera, right? There's you know, some thought that I've seen that you know, if we put uh, enough sensors and remote sensing capabilities under sea, for example, we might be able to use AI based on the data that it's gathering to effectively make the oceans transparent and therefore kind of deny the second strike capabilities uh, of some states. I don't think that we will get AI that, that's, that is that good. Um, and I, I'm not worried about kind of its impact on second strike uh, capabilities. If anything, in the kind of classical strategic deterrence domain, um, I'm, I would say it's probably a bit of a net positive in the sense that it's going to open up a lot of new verification mechanisms for existing arms control arrangements or potentially future ones. Um, where I am exceedingly worried, though, uh, has everything to do with what Helen just so kind of eloquently uh, and concisely described, which is the way that AI, modern AI works it's you know, formed based on statistical learning. My background originally was in, you know, statistical learning has been rebranded as AI, basically. Um, and the problem with that form of AI is that it fails in ways we don't understand. There's a massive probability space that it's trying to sort through. We cannot sort through that entire probability space ourselves. And so there's probably errors in there that we don't really have an ability to test for. We have no formal verification mechanisms right now for many of these systems. That means, uh, I'll kind of highlight um, two uh, risks that I see in particular, and that, and that could be destabilizing uh, with respect to um, uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, one um, is the risk of accidental use um, in the kind of navigation capabilities or engagement capabilities of, you know, frankly, a fully autonomous nuclear weapon, right? We know that Russia's got Poseidon. We know that these things are being actively considered. Um, if that weapon were deployed and it was not properly tested and evaluated and verified, that could be catastrophic. Um, I think we are going to have to think very hard about uh, the issue of AI safety, what global standards need to be for testing and verifying these things, what states are going to do, nuclear armed states are going to do in response to other states 
whose nuclear weapons we are not convinced have been tested and evaluated to use uh, safety or to a sufficient standard of safety that we're comfortable with. I, I, this is going to be an enormous diplomatic challenge, um, and I, I think we need to really begin thinking seriously about it. And the reason it's so destabilizing is, let's say the United States or, or just any country um, thinks that another nuclear armed power is going to deploy a fully autonomous or you know, some kind of weapon with an autonomous capability that is also nuclear armed. And we are not 100% sure that they have tested it and, and uh, verified it. Maybe we think it's 95% safe. What do we do to prevent them from actually deploying that technology? There are going to be some states that think we should actually do a first strike to take it out, um, depending on the level of safety uh, that we think is baked into that system. So that's, that's one risk that I think we just really need to address. A second risk would be um, the risk of accidental um, inf er, information in nuclear command and control systems that uh, um, uh, is inaccurate or that lead, you know, decision support systems that lead the users of those systems you know, to either believe false information or make a poorly informed choice. I'm very worried about, many of you may have seen, um, for example, Palantir has its AI system called uh, PAI that they're developing. This is where, in, in contrast to prior kind of, you know, to, to build on Helen's point earlier, there's some forms of AI and machine learning that are used in weapon systems that are very specific to a particular domain. So in the case of a, an autonomous weapon, for example, or a loitering munition, um, you know, they are trained on data that allows them to identify a very particular electromagnetic signature or a very particular kind of computer vision signature related just, you know, uh, entirely to one particular form of target and then it engages that um, fairly reliably. Frankly, one of the reasons I'm so worried about the example I just raised was, you know, the image from the Ukraine war that I can't get out of my head is the Russian Lancet that destroyed a Russian radar because it wasn't properly verified um, and it didn't pick up the right signature. It did the right thing, but uh, it shouldn't have, it sh you know, from a machine learning perspective, the machine itself thinks it did the right thing, but it wasn't properly tested and verified. Um, if, they, if they do anything in the nuclear domain that, that, that is that sloppy and that risk averse or risk acceptant, it's, it's deeply disturbing. Um, that's one form of machine learning, though. It's, it's very narrow, and it's focused on a particular kind of signature that they're trying to train for. In the kind of command and control systems of, of whether it's nuclear or non-nuclear, we're going to see more and more things like ChatGPT and GPT-4, multimodal models that are trained on vast arrays of language and text, and that can in real time suggest courses of action to the people who, over, who are overseeing those systems. If the data that those systems are trained on is not like appropriately tested and verified, um, that is deeply problematic uh, because we are going to have situations where commanders are going to have suggestions made to them about things to strike that may not, you know, I think many of you who have used ChatGPT may have discovered that, you know, it hallucinates occasionally. <laughs> I asked it for a, a, I had to write an op-ed on, on deepfakes a, a couple of months ago. And I asked it what I'd already written on the subject, and it came back with five extraordinary articles, none of which I'd never heard of before, but they sounded amazing. Um, <laughs> and you know, if we have the, that kind of thing in our nuclear command and control system or any command and control system, um, suggesting you know, hallucinations to commanders in the field, it's an extraordinary problem. Um, and it does destabilize nuclear deterrence architectures if countries think that nuclear armed states are integrating those kinds of systems into their nuclear command and control. So preventing that kind of thing is going to be absolutely vital going forward. Um, uh, I think I'll pause there, hopefully I haven't, again, I, I wanna be clear and, and walk this line of, we should be worried and we should be concerned. I don't think the sky is necessarily falling in the sense that all of this is inevitable and we just throw our hands up and you know, accept that this is gonna happen. But I think we need to take it with, uh, you, know, the, you, you mentioned the, um, the NIST kind of responsible uh, uh, a risk management framework, rather. In my view, this is the highest risk application of AI, and we need to kind of mount a policy and diplomatic response that is proportionate to that risk. And, uh, you know, hopefully that's something that we can talk further about later on. Yeah, great. Thank you for that overview. And it seems two things kind of stuck out to me of just, we've come to this idea of the training data, the testing, the evaluation, the verification. I know in ACA we did a project looking at risks of emerging technologies, AI being one of them, 
And one of the main ideas coming from that workshop on AI was the need for technical experts to talk to each other, especially at that testing, evaluation, verification stage. Mm -hmm. And then the second theme being transparency, right? Which is a word that all of us nuclear folks will know real well. And it's applicable here as well. Mm -hmm. um, all right, Paul, now it's time to bring you into this conversation. So I'll ask you to respond a bit to Helen and Chris to give us the official US government perspective. So including state defense departments, I know they work hand in hand, but how are they thinking about AI enabled capabilities and applications in the military? Is there, we are, given the number of documents we've seen coming out of the Biden administration, there is an awareness there, but can you speak a little bit more of how, or just how they're thinking about it, how they are aware and what they are, or not how, of what they're most concerned about, right, from that perspective. Um, and does the government have an extra dose of caution when it comes to AI and NC2? Well, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to be here. And uh, I should open by saying, if you're looking for someone to give you uh, sort of a fifth grade perspective on AI, you've come to the right place. Uh, so uh, unlike my eminent uh, co-panelists, I, I do not have deep technical expertise in AI. And so I, I really did appreciate that. Uh, that really helpful conversation. And I do think, of course, as in all areas, our policy, if it's going to be intelligent, has to be informed by um, sort of the thoughtful expertise of people who sort of understand the technology, the ins and outs. Um, I do think, from what I've heard today, that framing this in terms of risks and benefits is the, is the right way to start getting at the problem. Um, you know, I think that, uh, I, a lot of the risks that we've heard about today, we are very cited on, and we very much see this, and we very much agree that these are, are risks that we need to manage. And I would highlight that our Defense Department has done a huge amount of excellent work uh, in articulating how they will incorporate AI into their military applications in a responsible way. Uh, and there's, there's paper on this, but there, there's, I think there's a lot of smart experts um, both in the technical and in the policy area, working on this issue. And as we've heard today, this issue, it's much broader than just sort of lethal uh, uh, autonomous weapons or nuclear AI. This militaries will incorporate AI in a huge spectrum of ways, from logistics to communications and planning. And so there will be uh, AI, it's not an emerging technology, it's an emerged technology and will be used uh, by militaries in a wide range of applications. Um, and so I do think it's, it's right to talk about the risks and how we have managed the risks. From my perspective uh, at the State Department, I think our role um, and where we can be helpful in this is projecting U.S. leadership uh, and ensuring that we're building an international consensus around a normative framework of responsible use of military applications of AI. Uh, this is predicated, of course, on all the work that we have done on, on a domestic basis, but taking that and, and making sure that we're explaining this, we're having exchanges with our foreign interlocutors, and we're, we're bringing people coalescing around a vision of how states can use this responsibly. And I would say that we have a real opportunity um, as, as leaders in this area to, um, to, to forge this consensus now, uh, because this is, this is an area that there, there isn't, um, there isn't uh, sort, of, sort of existing consensus on. And so I think we have a real opportunity as a foreign policy matter to, to make sure that our vision of how to use this responsibility can be a shared vision and, and shared broadly, I think. And so that's one thing we're, we're quite cited on. It, sort of returning to the theme of risks and, and benefits, I mean, I do think, um, I think we shouldn't lose sight of the benefits as well, that you know, there, this technology uh, can help militaries deliver on their obligations under IHL, on distinction and proportionality. It can help militaries develop technologies that can you know, sort of increase um, in, 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 or decrease the odds of sort of unintentional uh, accidents. And so I think there are a lot of very positive applications as well. We, we shouldn't lose sight on that. And when we're articulating what can be a shared normative framework um, on the international level, it should be designed to maximize the benefits and minimize the risks. Uh, and that, I think, would be sort of the, the cornerstone of what a responsibility in military AI could look like. Um, you know, in terms of uh, risks uh, and benefits, again, we have taken a first step in this area, and we have released a, um, a, a political declaration on the responsible use of military AI. Uh, this is a flexible document. It's intended to be a, a flexible, non-legally binding document. Uh, we don't want to stifle innovation. We don't want to 
um, sort of move before the technology becomes clear, but we do think we're at the stage now where we can adopt a shared baseline of responsibility in these sort of enumerated principles. This is something that um, can be mutually advantageous to us and all of our interlocutors in guiding how militaries are going to incorporate this technology. Um, and so we think that this is a real, it's a step forward. We really um, invite broad discussion of this, both um, on the domestic level with uh, informed uh, experts because, um, and with our foreign interlocutors. And we really, uh, we, we invite a wide conversation on this issue uh, because we want to make this document stronger and we want to make sure it does work for the international community and that we um, can bring states together in a shared commitment to use these technologies in a responsible way. Um, I did want to give a few concrete examples of how we do envision these principles working. Uh, and I think a lot of these actually are, are, are sort of, I think, uh, flow from the conversation that we've heard today. Um, and I think it does, conf and this in my mind at least, confirms why these, this, this framework of responsibility is a real major step forward in this area. Um, you know, I think sort of based on your, your comments on uh, design capabilities, I think that that's we, one of our, our principles is that uh, states should have design capabilities with auditable methodologies. Um, you know, this would ensure that states can, can trace back through chains of events, uh, they can connect cause and effect, um, and they can enable corrective actions where corrective actions are needed. Um, this does require some technical sophistication to implement, and so, you know, in addition to just having a framework of principles, we also envision this as being something that's a forum in which states can, can have productive exchanges on an expert level uh, to make sure that states are implementing the, um, the commitments that they've undertaken. Another one is on rigorous testing, and we very much agree on this, and, and we're cited on this as a, as a major uh, area that I think it's in our strong interest to have a coalescing of view around a commitment to ensure rigorous testing. Um, I think there are uh, sort of unique features of AI that you all understand that I don't understand, but that at least I understand enough to know that um, it, 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 it's, a, it's a different, it sort of changes the, or, or sort of re-emphasizes the need for rigorous testing and evaluation and the kinds of systems that you're testing require a distinct, different testing methodology. Uh, we need to make sure that the tests can check for kinds of behaviors that self-learning might exhibit. And so we have to design a testing regime that is mapped on to the capability uh, in an intelligent way. Um, and so in addition to these, kind, these are just examples, I really do encourage everyone to study the document. It's on our website. Um, and you know, there are several other principles as well, which I think are an important step forward. Um, but I do think that you know, taken together, um, it's a way to take the amount of deep expertise and commitment to responsibility that the US as a domestic matter has, has shown on this issue um, and export that uh, on the international plane and start building a consensus uh, that this is how responsible states uh, are going to use this technology in their military applications. Great, thank you. You're setting up part two of this conversation really well when we're talking about strategies of risk mitigation. Before we dive in, I wanna give a reminder that after this, we're gonna be turning to questions from you all. So please feel free to start writing down questions and holding them up for staff to come around and collect. So before we go a little bit further into the risk mitigation strategies, I want to turn to you, Helen, because I'm gonna steal a phrase that Paul used, because I liked it, where we're at the stage to adapt the shared baseline of responsibility. Um, and so I'm curious, Helen, given your perspective, getting your perspective on is now the time, right? Is this the appropriate time to be talking about risk mitigation? And I know in the questions I gave you for this round, I was talking specifically and trying to pull on your experience of um, your knowledge of China's AI ecosystem, but what is the status right now? So I guess this is a two-parter. What's the status right now of research, development, employment of AI systems? And second, is this the time to be really digging into how do we address these risks and how do we do so effectively before we go into the full, I mean, if we're not already there, right, the competition among, in this, given our topic today, among specifically nuclear-armed countries. So I guess, what's the status report? Yeah, great. So 
talking about kind of R&D and then employment of AI in the US and China, I would say both countries are kind of full steam ahead on trying to do the best research, build the best products, use, you know, find the best military applications that they can, um, putting a lot of you know, money and, and effort into that. Um, and you know, as we are, we've talked about, you know, they're doing that throughout their military. So not just in weaponry, but you know, autonomous platforms, targeting, logistics, decision support, image analysis, you know, all kinds of different um, use cases. This is all very subject to what we've been talking about, these kind of tests and evaluation. Can you actually build a system that not only looks great in a demo um, from the company, but actually works operationally really, really well and well enough for what you need? And for some use cases, that's turning out to be doable. And for others, I think it's, it's difficult. Um, uh, I don't know if any folks here saw coverage this week of, for instance, um, not military related, but there was a helpline, an eating disorder helpline that decided they were going to fire all of their staff who were unionizing um, and replace them with ChatGPT because they had done some tests and thought that ChatGPT was going to do a decent job at this pretty basic, surely, anyway, surprise, surprise, uh, pretty quickly ChatGPT started on this eating disorder helpline giving someone advice on dieting and calorie restriction and that, you know, they shut down the program and decided they need humans instead. So that's a sort of um, you don't usually get that level of detail from the kinds of testing that are done um, in military settings, but I think that's pretty illustrative of the kinds of you know, challenges that, that we might see. So both the US and China would really love and talk big game about wanting sort of uh, AI superiority um, and wanting to really win this race, whatever that means. Um, uh, China uses the phrase to, uh, they, they want to overtake on the curve, which is a sort of Chinese idiom of um, you know, seizing your moment. Um, I think my expectation for what we'll see there is less that one side or the other is going to get some key advantage through AI, the way that you know, maybe we saw with, with stealth or with precision targeting. Um, I, my expectation is that it's going to be something a little more like um, the technology around tanks in the interwar period, where lots of different countries were building this new technology, trying to figure out should they be faster, should they be more heavily armed, you know, what, what's the, what do we need here? And it turned out that in the end, it didn't really matter who had sort of the, the very best tanks. What mattered much more was how you employed them. Um, so you have the French Maginot line against Blitzkrieg, and the difference is not the quality of the tanks, the difference is your operational concepts. Anyway, that's a whole other conversation, but just in terms of um, both countries are trying very hard to move quickly. Um, I don't expect that we will see one get sort of a really significant edge. On the nuclear side, I really, I mean, I would refer to, to Chris and Paul. I, I'm not aware of a ton of unclassified information on actual employment of AI in, in nuclear systems. Um, I do think that the political declaration from the US is, is a really great first step in you know, making official um, uh, you know, what you mentioned, the, the 2019 statement from Jack Shanahan was kind of a very early um, expression of US reticence to, to employ AI in NC2. And I think the political declaration really making that official is, um, is, is wonderful and, and, and pushing that out and trying to get more consensus on that will be really important. Um, I also think we need to be really cognizant of the fact that this is not just about uh, you know, is the final, you know, push the red button uh, decision being made by an, an AI system, but that there are a lot of peripheral systems, a lot of, you know, contributing factors um, that could also be automated, could also have AI built into them. So if you're using AI, for instance, to do situational awareness based on social media data, is that something that you could see an adversary come in and try and disrupt, or that could get disrupted just by some, you know, totally innocent but, but unusual factor that you know, hasn't been seen before in the data the system was trained on, um, that kind of thing. Uh, there are certainly, I'm, I'm not you know, enough in the nuclear space to have my own take on this, but there certainly are also people who are concerned about the, um, the point that, that Chris raised that he's less concerned about, glad to hear it, of you know, how does this affect um, uh, second strike capability um, and, and stability if you have, for instance, much better ability to understand where your adversary's um, uh, nuclear assets are. So I think there's a lot of uh, tricky things to still be navigated. In terms of the second part of your question, is this the time? I mean, you know, I, I feel like the best time was 10 years ago, and if not 10 years ago, then now, sure. Um, I think some things making it, I think the main thing not making it not the best time is essentially, you know, obviously the tensions that we're seeing in the US-China relationship. Um, uh, we've seen, you know, more of that this week. Um, uh, I think it's good to see the U.S. continuing to sort of do what it can on a unilateral basis or on, you know, with, a, a with allies basis um, in this space. I think continuing to express interest and willingness to um, competitors and adversaries to, to have discussions on this will be important. Um, 
yeah, I don't know. It, it's, I, I think it's the best time we have. Gotcha. No, thank you. That makes sense. And Chris, I'm curious as to your perspective too, since you're thinking about these risk mitigation strategies and um, how you're thinking about actually executing them, right? When, and I want to now go back also to what Paul had been saying, and um, I think this is going to be, again, very fam familiar to us nuclear folks of norms, norms building. Um, that seems to be generally the stage that we're at. That's some of what we've seen from the U.S. government. Um, so just, I know that there are a lot of norm skeptics out there when talking about anything, any type of technology. So I'm interested in your perspective on norms, norms and as well as where we might go from there. So Paul has started to talk a little bit about that, but curious as to what your work has been showing you on that front. Um, I, I would say, you know, norms are just enormously, are going to be enormously important here because I'm not convinced that uh, we're going to be able to bring certain actors like Russia and China to the table to really um, uh, engage these meaningfully in some of the you know, prior types of arms control agreements that we've seen in the past. One of the, one of the reasons I say that is actually it's very hard to come to arms control agreements for things if you don't ex ante have the ability to verify violations of any potential agreement. And with AI, it's almost impossible to verify this stuff. We, don't, we, just, we haven't really figured out what a verification regime would even look like for, uh, for some of these technologies. Um, because you can't just put a satellite over a country. You can't really even just monitor compute power, et cetera. It's, it's going to be very difficult there. That said, on the norm side, and what, one of the things that I am um, or does give me some optimism is that for the most part in the past, like you look at the uh, development of new norms and agreements around nuclear um, uh, issues, you know, it took, it wasn't until the technology itself was fairly mature in terms of understanding the, the kind of performance envelope of, of the missiles that were delivering them, the, the kind of number of warheads, the, the capabilities that these systems had. Um, it wasn't really until those pieces of the puzzle were kind of fairly clear to everyone before you had the norms discussion really, and, and our, you know, arms control agreements really start to kick in in earnest, um, which was basically a 20 year gap, right, between the early 1940s and, and early 1960s. Um, one of the things that I am, you know, um, again, a little bit optimistic about is that we are having these conversations somewhat early. I know a lot of people were kind of taken aback by like, how surprised they were by how good ChatGPT is, et cetera. I want to just kind of, uh, again, walk this fine line of, uh, you know, not being too hyperbolic, but also not underrating what's about to happen. Uh, ChatGPT is going to look a bit like child's play compared to what's coming uh, over the next decade. Um, and uh, we need to be thinking now about what kind of norms and agreements we're going to need, because once those kind of more advanced general purpose AI systems come, come out, you know, um, five years from now, eight years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, um, we, you know, if we start the conversation then, it's going to be very hard to catch up. Um, and so I'm, I'm really glad that we're actually starting to have these conversations in tandem with the technologies development. Um, and it, in particular, I want to just highlight the extraordinary uh, work, in my view, of, I, I, I hesitate to say this a little bit because I'm an American. It comes off as like, you know, I don't want to necessarily just come off as, as like patriotic fervor or something like that. But the work that the United States government, the DOD and the State Department have done uh, and how out far ahead of the curve they are in kind of pushing for greater transparency in particular on responsible, you know, whether it's the responsible AI pathways, uh, responsible AI pathways and related work that the Pentagon has done for years now, uh, going all the way back to 3009, whether it's the political statement, which I encourage all of you to read. I mean, I, I uh, was extremely uh, glad to see that come out earlier this year. Uh, it's the kind of document that is going to be very helpful. Again, I'm a little bit skeptical that some of this we're going to get arms control agreements. That kind of document and the more states that we can get aligned around some of the low-hanging fruit for what the norms should be, whether even if it's something as straightforward as unilateral declarations of nuclear arms states, that they are not going to put AI fully in control of nuclear command and control systems. It sounds like low-hanging fruit, but just getting that kind of statement from as many countries as possible and then get in nuclear armed countries as possible and then getting the rest of the world to kind of pressure other nuclear armed countries that aren't um, kind of, you know, as eager to sign it. Like that kind of thing really will, I think, make a difference and is one of the, you know, leading points of leverage we have. Um, the, a couple of other kind of areas uh, in addition to just, you know, unilateral you know, statements like that are some of the things that are happening that the U.S. is spearheading. Um, 
uh, I would say two really important things that uh, we need to work on are, um, one, just communications channels with some of our uh, biggest rivals uh, around AI and nuclear command and control issues. Um, uh, I cannot understate how important this is uh, precisely because um, of something that I'm about to say related to AI safety, which is we need to simultaneously really improve our understanding and the kind of shared consensus around what AI safety means and what an acceptable level of performance is for these systems before they can be deployed. Not developed, I think some of these states are gonna develop this no matter what, but we need to, I think, have much stronger global norms around exactly how um, performant these systems need to be before they can be deployed. Um, one of the, and, and you know, as those systems come into place, we're going to reach a kind of paradox um, where th these two things are gonna have to happen in tandem. We're gonna need new kind of communications channels. We're also gonna need to kind of create, you know, robust AI safety standards for all the reasons that we've talked about earlier. The one thing that I wanna put on the plate about how important communications channels is, is that there's a paradox with AI safety where the safer we get and the more we talk about how responsible we are and the more we talk about how safe we are, when it's some form of accident happens or some kind of unintended use happens, it makes it exceedingly difficult to de-escalate because the other side will not view it as an accident. They won't take it, they won't take your face value, your word at face value. To give you an example of what I have in mind by this, um, uh, in you know, 20 some odd years ago now, uh, in May of 1999, I think a lot of folks in this room probably remember the bombing of the Chinese embassy um, in, uh, in Belgrade. What you probably forget is that a week, around exactly the same time in the war, the, the, the um, Dutch Royal Air Force also released some munitions. They were cluster munitions. Um, they, they went off course and they destroyed residential property. One even landed on a hospital. It was a huge, it was a huge mistake. It was, it was a terrible accident. We only remember one. And the reason we only remember one is that the perception was because we used precision guided missiles, and in this case it was not a technical failure, the precision guided missiles hit exactly where we, you know, we wanted them to hit, or that they were programmed to hit. What that meant was it was almost impossible to convince China that this was an accident. Even to this day, you know, I'm, I'm involved with a, a US-China track two dialogue. It's the only kind of line of communication we have on AI and international security right now. You know, I don't want to make, uh, speak too much about that here, but one point I will say is that that incident has not been forgotten. Um, and we are going to have to have communications channels um, that we can rely on, even as, you know, we, we're going to get much better at AI safety, I have no doubt about that. But you're never going to get to full, get the error rate all the way down to zero. Mistakes will happen, even if it's on the human side or the technical side, mistakes are going to happen. And in those moments of crisis, we are really, really going to need strong communication channels, particularly in low trust environments. Um, otherwise, it's, it's, uh, it's, hard to, it's hard for me to feel kind of particularly optimistic going forward because it feels inevitable that there's going to be some of these crises that happen and without clear communication channels to de-escalate. Um, uh, you know, I think we're, we're headed towards um, something of a bad place. And I'm, I'm trying not to end on like doom and gloom, but uh, it's, uh, it's something that we're just, we're, you know, I think part of the reason I am concerned about it is I'm not seeing a lot of responsiveness right now among some of uh, some other kind of nuclear armed powers to the idea of needing to reinvest in our communications, our crisis communications channels. Um, uh, and I, I think, you know, whether it's during the course of the Ukraine war or maybe a little bit after when there's a little bit more daylight, I think we need to really invest in trying to get those, those norms around and, and agreements stood up. Well, you apparently were reading the questions that some of the audience put in because you touched on some of these themes and you're setting it really up, setting it up really nicely for Paul. So Paul, I'm kind of changing the questions I had given you initially because I like the ones the audience are giving better. Um, and so we're officially going into our Q&A session and I'm gonna bundle a few of these together. So if you can first speak to how states are expressing interest in the US proposal on norms for responsible military use of AI, specifically, as Chris said, was en ending on the note of nuclear powers, are Russia and China interested? Have they signaled interest? And then can you also discuss US leadership in AI standards and responsible application where China and Russia are not interested in AI capability, capability development restraint? 
And then uh, lastly, and this is a question that the audience member had posed to each of you, so truly feel free to weigh in, but to begin with Paul, are voluntary guidelines for responsible use of AI and military systems, especially NC2, enough or are agreed legal restrictions going to be necessary to prevent some of the risks that, that Chris had highlighted in catastrophe with AI systems? So just well, a few light ones for okay, you. Okay, <laughs> a couple, of, couple of easy uh, softball questions there. Um, I appreciate those questions. Um, I think um, I'll start with a question on sort of interest in norms because I really want to make it clear that you know, this is a, the beginning of a wide-ranging multi-stakeholder conversation and we're ready to talk to anyone who wants to be meaningful and constructive about it. You know, China has done work on this area. China has put out their own view of a uh, responsible uses of AI. We studied that document. It's an interesting document. It, we're open to a meaningful conversation with China on how we can work together to articulate a shared normative framework for responsible military AI. Um, I think that the document in general is getting quite good traction, um, you know, and I think it's, it's not simply an exercise of the U.S. or the U.S. and NATO. Uh, it, we, we have taken our diplomatic outreach on this um, very, very broadly, and I think that's the right move because this is an issue that all states have a, have a say in. They have a stake in this issue. Um, you know, we, we've had some conversations um, with some countries who don't have sort of active AI, sort of plans to incorporate AI into their their militaries, and our point to them has been, you know, you may not be interested in military AI, but military AI is interested in you. And so everybody has a view, everyone gets a vote on this one, and everyone has a stake in working together to articulate what a framework of responsibility looks like that works for the international community. And I think that's a, maybe a good segue into the, the norms question. Um, and I, I think you probably said it better than I could. And I, I, I think that, um, we're looking for the right tool for the job, and right now, at this stage of the development of these technologies, um, what we think is the most effective way forward is to secure consensus on a broad responsibility framework, a baseline of responsibility um, that that you know some of these technologies will evolve, they will change. We want to build in flexibility to account for that. There are, of course enormous verification sort of concerns with over-regulation in this area. We don't want to stifle innovation. We think, sort of hearkening back to the conversation, I think everyone has touched on, there are upsides to this technology in the military as well. We don't want to stifle upsides. So we've approached this as on balance. Where do we strike it when we think that the place to, to, to sort of land now is to secure agreement on a, a broad framework about how states will test, how states will communicate with each other, how states will publish their, their approaches. And so furthering some transparency, creation of a dialogue. I mean, I think one important part of this is, um, is the mechanism. And so we, we envision a forum where states can stay in touch on this issue and communicate best practices and that states can help build capacity to implement on these best practices. It's not good enough just to have rules if they're not being implemented, and so we think that there's a, there's a large capacity building work stream that could also be a part of this. Um, and so I think that um, both the broad geographical reach of this um, and I think the normative um, sort of rule-based sort of emphasis on the baseline of responsibility has gotten very wide support. And we, we think that this is a document we want to improve it, we're open to constructive feedback, but we think this is the document that could form the basis of a real emerging international consensus on this issue. Um, if I can say one other thing on, on nuclear, I mean, we, we, I, it's sort of similar to the risks and sort of uh, benefits conversation. We also see huge benefits in the nuclear space to AI on nuclear arms control verification. I mean, if we have a new emerging technology coming online, that can increase confidence in verifying the other side's data declarations, for example, that could be an incredibly useful, stabilizing example of how militaries and foreign ministries can use AI um, in, in sort of furtherance of, of arms control objectives. But we are, we're highly attuned on the, in the nuclear space to the risks of misimpression of, um, of sort of 
unintentional escalation that AI brings. We think these need to be studied further. I mean, we are really welcome uh, expert input on this because I think this is something that we have to get right. We have to understand, have a, we, we can't rush to regulate in this area without a very thorough, particularized understanding of what the risks are. And I think m further understanding on the risks of misperception and misinterpretation on states, and it's not just a fact, but how subjective it is that if a state perceives the other state as possibly incorrectly incorporating AI into some nuclear command and control system, that drives risks of escalation. And so understanding that, I think, is of course a first step, um, you know, precedent to or sort of thinking about how to solve it. But this is, this is where our head is right now. Great, thank you. And I'm gonna put a somewhat pause on that conversation because I have a follow-up question for Helen asking if you can explain for us five-year-olds, by the way, how AI would actually end up in NC2, because the system is closed, right? And this would be, to incorporate it into NC2 would be more of a national choice. Right, yeah, yeah. so I, I want, Chris should jump in here as well, because I'm more on the AI military, yeah. less on the nuclear True. side. So for but I, of you. I, I, my understanding of the basic idea for that would be, it would end up in NC2 because the country in question decides that they want software making their decisions, essentially. Um, and so I think there has been, uh, maybe in 2015, there was reporting of the, Rus the Russian undersea system that would have, be fully autonomous, essentially. Yeah, and so, the side and right, 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 exactly. So if you have a submarine that is able to fully autonomously decide to deploy a nuclear weapon, then you have AI in your NC2, essentially. I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, uh, Comment is right insofar as you know there, there are going to be some states that aren't going to upgrade their NC, you know, like their kind of nuclear NC2 or kind of open them up to, to have uh, AI fully baked in. Um, I would say that said there are there is going to be AI used in certain kinds of early warning detection systems, launch detection, things like that. Uh, so there, it's to say AI is never going to be used anywhere in the full pipeline of information that comes into a nuclear launch decision. Um, I think I'm not sure we'll be able to really ban that, right, uh, or kind of expect that, that states would not do that at all. Um, uh, what I'm much more worried about is something like the Poseidon uh, weapon system, um, where you know, in the, in the kind of abstract case, again, you might have like a nuclear-powered autonomous submarine that is nuclear weapons and is capable of selecting and detecting uh, and engaging targets autonomously, or it might have a mode that would allow it to do that. And I think that, if we do not have good insight and visibility into how that system has been tested and evaluated. You know, and part of the challenge here too, I think in the, in the long term, this is, I don't want to kind of get too far ahead, but one of the other challenges we're going to have in the coming decades is that some of these systems are going to rely on something called online learning, where they are updating their models in real time as they're acting in the environment. And the, so that, you know, they're not kind of given a model that's been trained and then that model is fixed until somebody decides to update it. They, they, are, they are kind of, you know, online learning systems um, are ones where, you know, you're going to be, you know, these systems are going to be interacting in an environment, learning from, as, you know, learning along the way as they're uh, interacting. For a, a system that's like under C, that we don't actually have kind of visibility into where it is, what it's doing, um, reliably understanding what the safety parameters are of that system uh, is going to be, exceedingly difficult, um, and it's going to, I think, uh, really create just an, an enormous challenge that we haven't really seen before with some of the existing um, uh, uh, nuclear challenges that we dealt with in the past. And so I, I appreciate the, you know, to bring it back to the original question, I do, you know, I think in the US, for example, I know some of our systems are fairly antiquated, and I think that's actually a great thing, because it's we very, th there are many hackers who know how to hack something that was built in the 60s and 70s, right? Um, and it's offline, and it's, it's actually, it's kind of a, a, a very, in a very strange way, a defensive strategy. We want um, the floppy disks. Yeah, like floppy disks are not bad uh, <laughs> uh, uh, compared to some other alternatives. Have we moved uh, on from floppy disks? Is that <laughs> I think, I think no, no in some, in some yeah, cases. Yeah, 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 no in some cases. So um, anyway, uh, so I appreciate the question, but I, I do think that there are still things that we need to worry about. With, with and can I just add on briefly yeah, to that yeah. as well, just to pick up on, the point about early warning. I think sometimes we think that the solution to any kind of risks from AI in a military context is to have a human in the loop. So if there's a human making the decision, if a human has to press the button, 
everything will be fine. Yeah. And I think that's really a misleading way to think about it. So you know, already in the Cold War, I think we, there were multiple instances of early warning systems triggering, right? And the humans, in each case, thankfully, the human said, oh, my computer thinks that we're being fired on. I think that's not right. Um, and so you could imagine something that I'm very concerned about in general with AI is this problem of over-reliance or of sort of over-trust, um, where uh, human operators get used to their AI systems being correct all the time, being super helpful, having the answers faster so they don't have to spend as much time figuring it out. And if we have similar you know, early, you know, false positive early warning systems saying there's an incoming missile and the humans are, even if there's a human in the loop, if that trust relationship, trust calibration, the human machine, you know, uh, uh, connection, the interface that they're using is not all exactly right, we could still have really terrible outcomes, even if the human is sort of making the decision in a, in a, in a legal sense. Cool. Thank you, and that's gonna set up nicely the last question, because we're even a minute or two over time. But if each of you can weigh, and I'm gonna, well, first of all, I'm gonna give each of you a question based off of the legislation from Representative Ted Lieu about keeping a human in the loop, because you brought up that, and I think this might be a good spot to end on. So Helen, for you, can you elaborate a little bit more on why the human, you already did, but to give us a better sense for why the human in the loop concept is a bit misleading, and so tying that directly to the legislation, is that legis proposed legislation a good step? Is it somewhat in the right direction? If not, what would you propose? Chris, my question for you will be, is this an effective risk mitigation tool? Is this legislation something that you would also recommend given, your, given the work on the subject? And then lastly for Paul, is this legislation something that the Biden administration would get behind? And if not, similar to Helen, what kind of would be the thing that you're thinking of next to follow the norms, the responsible behavior ideas? So if you can keep your answers brief, that would be great and we can release everyone into the rest of their evening. Helen, let's start with you. Great, yeah, so very briefly, I think um, having a human in the loop for those critical decisions is a great baseline, but we shouldn't treat it as meaning that then we're set. So human in the loop, yes, and then lots of attention to the test and evaluation, to the interface, the human-machine interaction, um, uh, and making sure that, that all of those elements are working really, really well, not just thinking, oh, there's a person, so we're fine. Cool. Thank you. Um, I would say, you know, I would just echo everything that Helen just said. I would also say as far as the legislation itself, you know, I, I view that as a signaling mechanism of signaling popular support because it's coming from Congress. I think I would be, uh, uh, I would think it's even more important if the Pentagon and state hadn't already been as far leaning as they are. But the fact that they are, like, I don't, I don't see this kind of happening anyway. Um, so I don't know that it's going to curtail, you know, the Pentagon from something it was, it was planning on doing or something. Um, uh, I think it's much more about signaling broad public support for this issue, um, and hopefully, in turn, will also kind of begin to, to set the, the stage for those global norms that I was talking about, where you know, we really do need, I think, as many countries as possible, kind of uh, publicly affirming that we need to have human oversight over AI, especially on the decision-making uh, uh, pieces of AI, uh, or uh, human oversight over nuclear command and control. Um, and uh, launch decisions, and you know, I think, I think we can get there, but it's going to take, you know, a lot of measures like that to, to do it. Great, thank you, Paul. Bring so, it home. human, human in the loop. I mean, this is U.S. policy, full stop. It's been policy for a while. Uh, you will also uh, see this as reflected in our principles on responsible AI use as principle B. We think it's important. It's an important thing to have an international consensus around as well. It's important for states, especially the P5, to have a sort of a mutually agreed baseline that there will be a human in the loop making employment decisions. Uh, and so that, I think, is an important stability and sort of um, a stability measure and a sort of a measure that pushes against potential misinterpretation or misperception. So um, strong agreement from us that this is something that, uh, you know, is a, it's, it, it is a feature of our domestic policy, and we would also like to see it as a feature for those reasons of an international normative framework. Great. Thank you. Thank you to all three of you. I really appreciate this conversation. I know I learned a whole lot. Um, so if you can join me giving our stellar panelists.